Mary Schmidt Campbell is the president of Spelman College, one of the nation's most prestigious women's historically black college. And David Thomas is the president of Morehouse College, one of the nation's most prestigious historically black men's colleges. Welcome to the South by Southwest studio. Thank you. So I, I first want to talk about the disturbing safety issues that I've heard about in the news. Um, Spelman, along with other historically black colleges, have had a lot of bomb threats. So personally, how are you? How is your faculty? How is everybody? And is the FBI any closer to finding who's doing this? Well, thank you for asking, Carrie. They were um, incredibly disruptive and disturbing. Um, the first was January 4th, and luckily we were closed for winter break. So that really wasn't uh, terribly upsetting, but the second two, February 1st and February 8th, came when everybody was back on campus. And February 8th came in the middle of the day while we were having classes, so everybody, the campus was fully populated. Um, and what it does, of course, is it makes you fearful um, it stopped everything in its tracks. Uh, we had to have a bomb squad come on campus with their dogs to make sure the campus was safe. Um, but in the end, what it also led us to do mm -hmm. was to do an extremely exhaustive inventory of all of our safety and security measures and get the federal government involved, Department of Education, Homeland Security, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, Department of Justice. Our elected officials were incredibly responsive. Our two senators, our two, uh, Ossoff and Warnock. Our mayor uh, stepped up with additional <clears throat> patrols. I mean, what we will, coming out of this, we will be a much safer and much more secure campus. So uh, it was a terrible thing to experience, but um, it definitely has not stopped us. We remain undaunted. That's good to hear, because that would have shook me to the core to know that you actually are coming out of it stronger. Is, I mean, I guess that's the kind of thing that we've been learning after a pandemic is we have to find our lemonades. You know, we have to figure out how to make the best of these situations. Absolutely. Um, so you're both here to talk about a unique education to career program um, to help traditional and non-traditional students. <clears throat> Can you tell me more about what your schools are doing? Sure, so uh, Spelman College for a very long time was trying to really reconcile this notion of, of going online because of course we're a small residential liberal arts college mm -hmm. and we're exclusively for women, for black women. And so everything about online seemed to be anathema to who we were. Online means um, remote learning. Uh, it's co-educational for us. Mm -hmm. uh, it would have been, it, it, it was lots of people and when, once you're fully ramped up. And, and it just seemed to be very different from who we were. But once we kind of thought deeply about the core of what we do as educators, we felt, um, absolutely convinced that having online education was especially important for adult learners because the core of what we do says that we're here to educate you to become lifelong learners. And if that's truly the case, then we should be able to extend that into the adult population. And moreover, there was the, we had some aspects of our education that we thought were particularly transferable to that space. We're an asset-based educational philosophy. Mm -hmm. We look at that student in terms of your strengths and what you can bring into the, the learning sphere. Uh, we're an active voice educational philosophy. We're not there to just pour information and pour facts into you. We want to call forth your voice. We want you to participate in your own learning experience. And most of all, we're a growth mindset educational philosophy. It's like you're going to, where you are now is not where you're going to be a year from now or five years from now. And so we realized that's a perfect, perfect set of values to take into uh, America's workforce. Man, I can't imagine being at a college during pandemic. I mean, how is your school doing? Um, we, we've actually emerged, uh, we're back 
fully residential. Mm -hmm. uh, and in many ways, we've emerged much stronger than we were at the start of the pandemic, ironically, um, <clears throat> including um, having, you know, to your earlier question, um, we launched this year our first online degree program uh, in partnership with 2U mm -hmm. um, and targeting individuals with some college but no degree. Yeah. And the take up of that program has just been phenomenal. We're, we've already surpassed where we thought we would be in three years uh, with the age range in that cohort of 27 to 72. Wow. Um, and that's one program, it's business management. Um, we're planning by next year, we'll also have a, at least one other program and that'll be in computer science and perhaps two, uh, another one in marketing. And we're expanding our reach there as well with a partnership with Gill uh, that's bringing to us companies that want to invest in their employees uh, so that they can work while also completing their degrees and increasing you know, their human capital and, and, and value in the, uh, in the marketplace. And so, um, um, you know, so, so we're feeling pretty good about what's been happening. And I mean, had, in addition, um, our on-campus program um, this year enrolled more students than ever in its history. So we're, you know, we're feeling pretty good. There's lots of work to do though. So between your virtual and your on-campus, are you seeing just a huge amount of participation? It sounds like it's accessible for people who maybe weren't gonna go back to college. Yeah, so our, our online program is specifically for individuals who uh, are adult learners. So it's not open to that 17 to 23 year old who's mm -hmm. part of our traditional residential program. Um, and uh, there's lots of excitement about it. And as well, you know, during the pandemic, we also learned how to enhance our on-campus offering by utilizing, you know, distance learning and digital tools. Uh, which has made the time our students spend in the classroom much more period of, you know, value add rather than doing things that, you know, uh, are foundational or that they could easily get online uh, asynchronously in some cases, so, yeah. It must be less intimidating to go online if you're kind of older than the population that would be on campus. Make it more encouraging to go back. Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, what do you think are uh, essential for employment uh, for the coming decades for your students? So I, I like to think that uh, as you think about the 21st century and you think about where the growth is going to be in the workforce, um, what you really want, what, what employers really want are, are citizens who are going to be able to think creatively, uh, critically, to have, have great presentation and communication skills, to be aspirational, to be collaborative, all of those attributes are going to be extremely important in addition to what, uh, whatever other vocational skill they might be learning. And so what, what Morehouse and Spelman do in terms of a liberal arts education is absolutely essential to growing that aspirational innovative workforce. And we have a partnership with guilds as well. And so this has made it really a, a, a wonderful way of thinking with the corporate partners about how we can customize our educational offerings uh, to really be meaningful for uh, students. So for example, uh, one of the first courses that we're offering is leading self and leading others. Oh. This notion that, you know, I'm here doing the job that I'm doing, but I really, I'm a, I'm a leader. I know, how to, I know how to inspire people, motivate people, I know how to get things done. And understanding how you move from your own self into the sphere of getting others to, to, to follow along with you. Um, we do that and we do very specific skills like project management and offering a course that's going to lead to a, a certificate in project management or business essentials that are very specific about those specific skills. But, but ultimately, the core of liberal arts, of getting someone to think 
more deeply and be able to do that complex critical thinking, that's really the core of what we are as colleges and what we're going to translate to the online environment. Some of these kids, you're training for jobs that haven't been invented yet. So that's right. Sounds like you're making better human beings that are able to evolve. And, and, uh, and you know, I, I think you're absolutely right. We're, we are training individuals for jobs that today do not exist, right? And what we know is that by the time we get halfway through this century, half of the jobs that exist today won't exist. And we can't say that we know what the new jobs will be. So to Mary's point, you know, that set of critical problem solving skills and thinking skills uh, are as important as the other kinds of literacies that that people need you know one of which is digital literacy uh, you're not going to be able to survive not that you, everybody has to be a computer science but you've got to understand that in the utilization of technology and the other skill is around data data analytics uh, and and how you use that to you how you use data to actually uh, solve problems and, and ask good questions. I think that critical thinking is the best thing that you can teach anyone in any discipline, whether it's English or computer science. So I'm, I'm really happy to hear that you're working on the whole person rather than just Absolutely. the skill set, because that's really going to create a better humanity. How are students uh, to thrive in an economy with a growing trend towards more freelancing and gig economy jobs? Well, one of the interesting things about going online that we've had to think about for the adult learner is, is to make sure that as we are orienting them to that space, that we orient them also in terms of managing their time, managing themselves, ma managing really how they're going to balance their work life, their family life, and the obligations of being in, in a learning space. And part of the gig economy is really understanding you're, you're indep if you're independent from a corporate setting or a business setting or anybody else who's giving you directives and giving you your own time, you really have to understand how you're managing yourself. And so that, that concept of leading self is absolutely fundamental, not only if you're in, in um, a, a business setting, but absolutely if you're going to be entrepreneurial. And in fact, speaking of entrepreneurship, Morehouse and Spelman yeah. have a joint uh, entrepreneurship program, a Center for Black Entrepreneurship, which we intend also to take online. Nice. Yeah, one thing I, I would say about um, the, the gig economy that um, we have to teach our students to understand is um, how value is created in that economy because what will likely happen in this gig economy is that there will be high value add jobs uh, that are gonna change over time. And then there's gonna be um, a part of the economy that is essentially about companies finding cheaper ways to employ labor for low jobs. Mm -hmm. and that the economy is evolving. Today's high value add, a decade from now, could be in the low value add column. And if you don't know how to continually develop yourself in that gig economy, mm -hmm. you will find yourself floating to the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's why I think what we do as liberal arts institutions is so critical. Right? that it's not just about a vocational skill, but it's really about teaching people how to think and how to shape the environment around them uh, and figure out what that value add is that they bring to whatever they're doing because companies won't do it for you. Mm -hmm. right? You won't have a ladder right. that says, you know, you go level A, level B, level C, right? Work your way up. It's going to be working your way around mm -hmm. and spiraling right. up. Right. Uh, I think a lot of people think that when they go freelance or they go gig working that I'm my own boss. I want to find that work-life balance. And I heard Stacey Abrams the other day on a podcast say there's no such thing as 
life work balance. It's, it's, it's life work Jenga. Like you figure <laughs> out how to move all the pieces so that you're still standing. That's right. You really, really have to create those kind of humans that are able to evolve and adapt with everything that's going on rather than, like you said, ending up on the lower end and being just cheap labor. Right. Yeah, I, I like to think of it as um, it's not a balance, it's, it's an equilibrium. Right. And equilibriums are dynamic. So what today has you in equilibrium may not be, right, the equilibrium that, that you'll need to create four years from now, five years from now. I think about my own life. Um, 20 years ago, you know, my equilibrium state looked very different than it does today. And I'm sure that it'll evolve as, as I, you know, continue to develop as well. I mean, none of us expected the pandemic to come in and just slap us all. A lot of us had to reinvent ourselves, find sure. new ways. And uh, I, I think that uh, that's definitely changed the way all of us think about our careers and our futures is that, you know, we, we have to stay agile, stay on our toes. Yeah, and, and it's true for institutions as well. And, <laughs> and, and you, you, you know, um, the pandemic was a horrible thing. There's no question about it. But the silver lining is that um, it forced many of us to make changes that may have taken us a few more years to make had that not happened. Mm -hmm. So the embrace on the part of our faculty, we have a terrific, fa excellent faculty, 80% um, of them had never taught a course online. 90% um, of our students had never taken a course online. So in the space of literally a few weeks, there was, it happened in spring break, yep. mm -hmm. March 2020. Yep. Uh, we had to press pause for two weeks and do intensive training. Not only that, we learned many of our faculty had computers that were 15, 20 years old. Ooh. Some of our students didn't have laptops at home. Some of our, our in our community didn't have Wi-Fi access. So we also learned that uh, not only understanding how to teach, but even to have the tools for teaching was necessary. But we did that. We, it was intensive, it was immersive, and we came out of that with an expertise that we had not had previously. The teachers became the students. That's right, that's right. <laughs> Lifelong great learners. Way of putting it, right. yeah, <laughs> thanks. So, Dr. Campbell, you have a lot of experience in the arts and uh, come from an arts background. Um, can you explain how artists and artistic skills will be valued in the years ahead. So um, my husband is a physicist and I'm an art historian. We've been married 53 years and we keep telling each other, this is, this is the whole reason why we've stayed together for half a century. <laughs> we, Tell me the secrets. Yes. <laughs> we keep telling each other that um, science requires the same kind of creative energy that the arts require that same spirit of figuring out, putting there what didn't exist before, of using the imagination to consider what might be possibilities. And um, that's, I, I feel very strongly that whether, whatever college it is, whether it's a liberal arts college or whether it's MIT, you know, primarily an engineering school, the arts has a vitality and a place that really drives the creative energy. We have something called the Innovation Lab at mm -hmm. Spelman. We set it up about mm, six years ago, and it started out maybe as big as a shoebox. But we called it our Creative Commons, and we put all kinds of technology in it, but we also put some fabrication space, and we said, anybody can come here and learn um, a skill or do a project, and you can collaborate over, over disciplines. In the space of six years, 400 projects have come out of there, many of which have gone on to national and international competitions. And we now have a, 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 a much larger space. And at any time during the day, literally it is packed with students, not only from Spelman, but also from Morehouse and Clark Atlanta, because it says, as a computer scientist, I can come in and have a conversation with a dancer who can have a conversation with a biology major, and guess what? We can make a drone out of synthetic cellulose, make it fly, and design it beautifully, because that artist has been part of it. 
So, so um, it's amazing what you can unleash when you give people some creative space. You are speaking my language. <laughs> I cover my art background as well, but I'm a STEM advocate. And I think that science and art didn't used to be pigeonholed and separated. Yeah, look at Leonardo da Vinci. Look at yeah. that. I mean, there's, I, I don't think that Ada Lovelace would have come up with the computing system if her right. dad hadn't been an artist. Right. I think it takes that kind of creativity. It's all Absolutely. just fostering curiosity. Scientists and artists are one and the same. And I, exactly. I hope that schools start saying STEAM instead of <laughs> STEM. I am such an advocate for that. Okay, so um, Dr. Campbell, you're retiring in June. When you look back at your tenure, what are some of the highlights? Well, first of all, the students. I, 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 I don't teach. My colleague here does, does teach, but I don't teach. But I had something called the President's Reading Circle. And I would select a book, and then I'd invite a group of students to come and read the book with me, and we'd have conversations. And of course, you know, we'd have dinner, and then we'd have some fellowship, and then we'd sit down and we'd talk about the book, and we would read some incredible books and have the most penetrating conversations. And that's how it, it, it enabled me to connect with my students at a deep level, to hear what they were thinking, to hear what troubled them, um, to hear how they, how they looked, how they considered themselves and how they considered themselves in the world. And I have loved that I have, did not miss a year, I'm proud to say, right through the pandemic. In, in, in fact, during the pandemic, I held several book uh, circles. But now I have a whole group of students, you know, who go, I've gone through these, these book circles and I've stayed in touch with them. Some of them now are in law school, have finished their law degrees, <laughs> and they still stay in touch with me. So that, has been, that was a real highlight, to get to know the students at that real deep level. The other thing that I, I really am proud of is that when I first came to Spelman, I invited the local principals to come in for dinner. Mm -hmm. And I said at the end of dinner, I said, how can Spelman be helpful to you? And it stunned me because we had elementary, middle school, and high school teachers, as principals. 201, they said, teach our students to read. What? And I was stunned, stunned. So what we did is we took our, we have a great education department and someone who specializes in family literacy. We put out a call, 150 students came forward to be trained in literacy training. They went out to the schools, fifth, sixth, and seventh grade, and worked with about, a, about 150 students in one-to-one -one tutorials. Over a period of three years, the students who had been part of this program, we called it Spell Reads. I like that. <laughs> um, realized improvements in their reading assessment that went anywhere from 9% to 21%. We're doing a similar program now with math proficiency. And what I love about that is we're taking the educational and emotional and intellectual capital of our students mm -hmm. and investing it back in our community, in our schools, in our next generation. God, that makes me want to tear up. That's so and wonderful. I just, I, I, I love that. It's the thing I think I'm, one of the things I'm most proud of. In uh, 2017, Spellman took some heat for announcing it would admit transgender female students. What's been the reaction since then? There hasn't been any. Really? No. I mean, it really, it, 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 it did, it created a firestorm, um, but we spent two years discussing it, um, uh, discussing it with all of our major stakeholders, our students, our faculty, our staff, our groups of alumni. Um, we thought about a very, we looked at other schools, we benchmarked ourselves against other women's schools, um, and finally came to this decision. We made it, there was a firestorm, and knock wood, I don't see any wood around, <laughs> um, we we haven't we haven't heard um, anything. Since Fantastic. Then. Thank you. All right. Well, so my final question is: What are some of the myths about HBCUs that you would like most to see disappear? I'm going to I'm going to quote mm. my colleague here. You know, <laughs> he 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 said very very candidly this this afternoon that in the in the past there was a sort of an undertow that said, well, if it's, if it's an HBCU and it's black, it's probably not as good as. Hmm. 
Nothing could be further from truth. And I say that I was a graduate of Swarthmore College. We sat on their board for 12 years. Wonderful school. I worked at New York University as a dean for 23 years. Wonderful school. Spelman College has something that neither of those schools has. And it is, um, it is phenomenal in the outcomes that it produces as a result. And I, that is one of the things that I would like everybody to know. <laughs> I like that answer. I feel very positive that you two are shaping the generations for the rest of us. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you for you. coming into the South by Southwest live studio. Uh, I'd also like to thank all of you for watching. I'm your host, Carrie Byron, and thank you for, for watching us and sticking around. You can see the schedule for all of our upcoming interviews at southbysouthwestedu.com slash studio. And you can all watch our studio interviews at the South by Southwest EDU TV app, available on Apple TV, Roku, Android TV, Amazon Fire, iOS, and Android mobile devices, all the things.